Coming up on Need to Know, the Black Lives Matter movement of today and the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Two causes for justice, but will our modern day fight for human rights result in the type of changes instituted in the past? That's next. Also on the show, finding humor in issues such as racism and policing can be tricky, but a locally filmed and cast web series is focused on lightening up some of the most intense issues of our day. The comic relief of dark justice is ahead. And is there a chance we could start mistaking the birds of the air for drones? We'll learn about new rules that will impact the use of these unmanned aircraft systems. Need to Know starts right now. Black Lives Matter, which launched three years ago, is now a household slogan. It's recognized throughout social media. It's discussed by everyone from politicians and celebrities to kids. It has launched protests and debates around the U.S. and here in Rochester. But what's the end game for this modern day movement? How much does it align with and differ from the civil rights fight of the 1950s and 60s? And can it bring about real change in our community? Joining me for our discussion is former civil rights attorney Attorney, now president of Nazareth College, Don Braveman, author and educator Banke Awupetu Makola, president and professor of church leadership at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School, Marvin McMickle, and veteran journalist and WXXI's director of news and public affairs, Randy Gorman. Thank you to all of you for being here. And just to, to begin, I should let viewers know that we had a member of the local group, Black, affiliated with Black Lives Matter, scheduled to join us for this discussion. And shortly before the taping, uh, they canceled and they were we're not able to provide an alternate to join. So uh, a critical voice that we need to hear, but we'll hear from it in the future. So just to begin, you know, some have dubbed the Black Lives Matter movement as one of our civil rights movements of today. And I, I'm curious to know, and I'm going to give this to you first, Marvin, is this an accurate portrayal of what we know to be true about this modern day movement? Or is this really, does it really represent the start of something new and different? Well, in some respects, it is a continuation of a very long problem, which is police misconduct. Uh, the conflicts between African Americans and law enforcement did not start three years ago. This has been a 200-year-long struggle, and I think the extent to which the Black Lives Matter movement tries to give us a focus on the number of instances when police officers abuse their authority particularly in arresting, detaining, and sometimes pummeling in public uh, with cell phone coverage to show it, uh, this is a very old problem. So I think to that extent, yes, this is a continuation of a long-standing issue, and it's nowhere near being resolved. Well, I, I want to know, I actually want to compare and contrast the goals uh, of Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. uh, versus the goals uh, of the civil rights movement. Is there overlap or, or are they very different? I believe the overlap in that they're both trying to um, identify and dismantle systematic racism. So when we think about the civil rights movement, we think about wanting to change legislation and open um, more opportunities. Black Lives Matter is looking for the same thing. So when we see, like you said, police misconduct, people being pummeled, killed on social media, you know, via the news, people are recording it and nobody is being held accountable and through our courts, that's a direct parallel. Yeah, I think the the focus of the you know the 60s versus today may be different, but it, as um, has been said, it's clearly part of a continuum. I mean, the focus in the 60s was on voting rights and civil rights. I mean, the movement led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is probably the greatest civil rights act ever enacted by uh, Congress. It led to the Voting Rights Act in the following year. So the focus then was more on political and civil rights. 
this is a continuation of this. This is part of a civil right. I mean, the, the right to, to life, liberty, um, yeah. with due process. And so um, I see it as a continuation, but I see it as a different emphasis. Um, and maybe in part, it grew out of that movement mm -hmm. because, I mean, today there's still clearly issues with voting rights, right. and we mm -hmm. saw it right. just recently with the North Carolina court, the federal court, North Carolina, striking down one of the most restrictive, racially restrictive Voting Rights Act ever. Um, so those issues continue, but the emphasis has shifted, I think. Yeah. And one of, the, one of the issues, of course, for the sort of Black Lives Matter hip hop era generation mm -hmm. is their realization that despite all the gains mm -hmm. of the 50s and the 60s and the promises mm -hmm. that the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Act were supposed to bring, systemic racism continues. And so I think their frustration is, even though we had the Martin Kings and the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Stokely Carmichaels of the past, it looks to them as if the path has not been made easier, primarily because the structural racism mm -hmm. that undergirded all of those systems of the 50s and 60s still seems to have quite a stranglehold. And, and <clears throat> given certain political personalities of the day, appears to be actually regenerating itself. And it's more frustrating <laughs> because that stranglehold isn't always visible for people to yeah. see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even when we're when you have direct video footage and people say it's not an issue or they bring up black on black crime, which mm -hmm. we all know is just a false construct in itself, mm -hmm. it's different than civil rights because you could blatantly say, okay, we're not allowed to do certain things. But when our our movement is based in such a structural um, hard to pinpoint mm -hmm. um, instances, it's yeah. harder to get community to rally behind it. Yeah. And also, I, I would just mention that uh, some of the issues, and as you know, Helene, we did at WXXI a, a radio series a couple of years ago about the anniversary of the, uh, the Rochester riots. Yeah. Some of the issues involving structural <laughs> racism uh, and a lot of those, of course, some of those were civil rights involving, you know, police uh, treatment of, of civilians, but also had to do with issues involving housing discrimination and economically, things like those. Some of those issues are coming up again, even with the folks involved with the local Black Lives Matter movement. Now, obviously, they've been focusing a lot on their treatment uh, by police, but they're, I think, trying to broaden it to include economic and social justice issues overall. So I... I Myself, I see a lot of parallels in the two movements. It's just perhaps they're being framed a bit differently right now. One of the, one of the, I might just say one of the interesting things locally that shows, you know, as a client once said, what goes around comes around. And um, in the 70s, I was involved in a lawsuit here brought against the Rochester Police Department to try to get them to hire more black and Hispanic police officers. At the time, there were fewer than 4% of the, of the police department um, were members of minority groups. And the result was a consent decree that required the department to increase to at least 25%. And they had to hire in a, in a, you know, hire a certain percentage of black and Hispanic um, applicants. What's interesting is they did it, and Rochester, quite remarkably, is the, probably the only city that I know of in the United States that still is operating under that kind of consent uh -huh. decree. Yeah. But the reason in the 70s that we needed to do that, we, and, and the police chief at the time recognized this, was we needed to get more people from that community to become police officers, to change yeah. the whole relationship that right. existed. I want to ask about leadership. Uh, when we, you know, I think of certain faces are synonymous with the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and John Lewis. And we, we don't seem to have these central, these key figures when it comes to Black Lives Matter. And even with the local groups, they say, you know, it's not about one particular leader. We're all in this together. And I'm curious to get your thoughts or your perspectives on this. Do you think that this is intentional or do you think that it's just someone just has not stepped up to to lead this charge I believe it's intentional if we're students of history we know what has happened to our leaders and who wants to put their um, their life on the line literally to do that right and so 
the movement is more so leadership in all of us. We don't want to just wait for one person to be that, that Moses, that one person to lead us to the promised land. Because what happens when that one person is killed because of it? What can we do as a community? So I think that what black does and a lot of um, younger people, they try to have an equal distribution of the work, of the responsibility, and people are really doing that in a variety of ways, including education, social justice. The police brutality is just one piece in it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, you know, I certainly affirm the right of every generation to define the way in which they want to go forward. Um, I was a part of the civil rights generation. I do remember that it was a very structured uh, approach to problem solving, both at the national, regional, and local levels. Um, but I think time will tell the degree to which sort of everybody is a leader in their own right, will be able to move the ball forward and nobody is held singularly responsible. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned because I'm, the same thing was said about Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. that you know we're all sort mm -hmm. of leading this together. And I think what happened was that nobody was. Mm. And so over time, what could have been a really wonderful and powerful organization just kind of withered away. That's I hope that doesn't happen with Black Lives Matter, but I'm, I'm concerned about that. And, and I was just going to say, just in terms of, uh, you mentioned at the uh, the start of your comments, Helen, you know, trying to get someone from the, the local uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement here, uh, it is a bit challenging for the local media here in terms of when we reach out and try to get a spokesperson for the group, sometimes there's one or two people we have been dealing with a bit, but they, again, uh, as Banke mentioned, they do like to kind of diffuse a bit the, the leadership and have a number of people involved. But at the same time, I think that makes it a bit challenging for their organization to get maybe the kind of publicity they want if the media can't quickly find someone to talk to. And that's that's kind of the balance or the challenge you're going to face with any organization. But uh, And also, in terms of just consistency of message, I mean, that's up to the organization how they want to define themselves. But uh, if you want to have a, a couple of key points to come out, it's sometimes useful for organizations to have one, two, three, or whatever certain number of people who are definitely going to be the ones mm -hmm. speaking for that group. Otherwise, I think sometimes you'll get a mixed message out there that maybe Again, from our perspective, from the outside perspective of the media, we may not uh, understand exactly what they're trying to say because we may hear it from different places. Yeah. I want to stick with you in this, Randy, and, and kind of piggyback what you, what you said, Marvin, about the concerns of not having a particular leader. How much does the media, or can the media, influence something like that, the leadership? Because if you look at you know, Martin Luther King, the media almost like anointed him to mm. be one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. Is something like, could something like that take place now, or is it difficult because of social media, or everybody has a voice? and can be a leader it, to a certain extent. Yeah, I, I think Marvin's point before was, I think there's a generational thing going on here. I'm old, so I, <laughs> I mean, and I, uh, I'm with you. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, one of the concerns I have about the movement is there is no leadership. I mean, we don't have the kings, the Abernathys, you know, up there yeah. leading a movement with a specific goal. I mean, the NAACP, the way the Brown case was decided, the school desegregation case, that was a plan that resulted from the NAC, the NACP developed a plan in 1930. Right. To, develop, to end up desegregating schools in the 50s. So, you know, I come from a, the school where you really want to be have something centralized. I think there's a generational difference. I, and it's not just with the, the Black Lives Matter movement. It's just generally, the, this generation is more go it on your own, um, you know, social media. Anybody can say anything mm -hmm. on social media. And so, uh, you know, I guess I got to adapt. <laughs> right, and how we define leadership, right? right. Because I hear your points, and um, when you raise the parallel between Occupy Wall Street, that was like a light bulb moment, yeah. and definitely not wanting to repeat that mistake, yeah. right? Yeah. So having um, a planned and strategic um, outline to how we're going to get the result that we want, those outcomes, yeah. but then allowing room still for people to figure out what's their role sure, sure, in fulfilling sure. that. Yeah. So I think there's a balance that needs to be sure. had. And to the point about the media, um, as far as it making it harder for media outlets, I understand that. But you also understand, too, that after you know 200 years of this struggle, we're not really, and when I say we, I'm just saying this generation, we're not really trusting traditional mm -hmm. media outlets and taking some of that ownership back. And you know, mm -hmm. you have Facebook Live, you have Periscope, you have live streaming. Again, it's equal distribution and finding different ways to elevate your mm -hmm. voice so you can make sure it's not altered. And we see that happening, obviously, in, in politics, too. You know, uh, a lot of politicians choose not to use the filter of the media. They put mm -hmm. out their own, yeah. uh, whether it be videos or, or other types of comments Tweets. or blogs. Uh, you know, or, 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 <laughs> certain, certain politicians on Twitter, uh, but they try to go 
<laughs> outside of the filter of the media, yeah. which I totally understand. Yeah. And I think, Helene, you mentioned uh, you know about anointing uh, a leader. It's a different time as, as Don and everybody else mentioned. But uh, also, I think social media makes it in some ways easier, in some ways harder to to have someone else. They're very dynamic uh, to really stand out. Uh, yeah, stand out that, yeah. Because really, there, a lot of people can stand out. You know, maybe if it's only for a short period of time, mm -hmm. but through if their social media goes viral on a particular subject. You know, you may have someone who's a leader for a while, but it uh -huh. may be tougher for one person to really kind of gain ownership of the, you know, the, and I'm saying that that may be a good thing, but that's yeah. kind of the reality I we're facing now. I think there's safety in that. Mm -hmm. Because again, when we're mm -hmm. talking about um, leaders and what has happened with those, you don't want to be that scapegoat. You mm -hmm. don't want to be that martyr. Um, and being able to, different people to step up at different, um, mm -hmm. different phases, mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. critical. It was about a year ago, I spoke to youth organizers with the group Teen Empowerment, and they mm -hmm. talked about Black Lives Matter, and they saw it as their goal as being, you know, we're, it's the f work that we're doing every day. They said it's to get, you know, more young men and women of color to graduate from, from high school in the Rochester City School District. We're having trouble, we're not seeing that. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, finding justice in the criminal justice system. They said it's this collective collective effort that we all have to work together mm -hmm. to do, which is something Bonke that you mentioned. You know, aside from that, Don, you said, you know, we don't we don't have this central leader, leader so therefore it's hard to see, um, you know, what goals are mm -hmm. clearly defined. But is there is there a potential, you know, end game that we could see? Is there a hopeful solution based on what we're hearing, at least, you know, locally mm -hmm. with the, the group Black or even nationally with the movement? Are there changes that, that you think uh, could potentially take place based on what we're looking at right now in the national climate and locally? Well, I, mean, I think ultimately the aspiration is for the broader society to look upon all minority groups as persons of equal worth and value. Yeah. Uh, that's really the issue that we've got going on right now with the Khan family, that every person is entitled to the same set of constitutional rights. And the historic struggle for this country has been in truth, that black lives have never mattered. Mm. And so how do you, coming out of an experience of 240 years of slavery, another 100 years of segregation, how do you say to America, the people that you once looked down on as chattel property and scorn because of color are, in fact, the same persons of worth and value as you yourself? Mm. And if we can't get people to see in one another a person of equal worth and value, then our work goes on. And I think that colleges have a huge role to play in it because one of the things I've seen in our student body is more and more the students are coming from high schools that are predominantly like them. There is no, the, the integration of the public school system has really been lost. Well, we have to wrap for now, but I want to say a special thank you to all of you for sharing your perspectives with our viewers and for continuing coverage of the Black Lives Matter movement and the local effort to improve police community relations. Stay tuned to WXXI News Radio, television, and online at WXXINews.org. The Black Lives Matter movement has served as an inspiration of sorts for murals, music, and new films. It has also influenced a local web show filmed in Rochester. It's called Dark Justice. But this web series is far from a dark drama. It takes a satirical look at racism and policing as it tracks the story of the first black police officer in a small town. Take a look. Freeze. Stanton, it's me. I don't know me. Come out with your hands up. It's Officer Johnson. Officer Amir Johnson? We drove here together? Oftentimes in a burglary, the assailant returns to the scene of the crime. That's not the assailant. I'm your partner. Okay, I'm gonna stand up now. Okay, great. <sighs> ah! I'm sorry, it was, it was a reflex. You know what? I'm starting to think there's some problems between the police and the black community. And I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. Jay Holloway, the lead actor of Dark Justice, joins me now to talk humor, controversy, and race relations. Welcome to the program. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here, Elaine. So, Shay, I have to ask you, when you first read the script and you see this comedic approach at, at racism and policing, what did you think? Were you a, a little apprehensive about being I was involved? like, I have to jump into this. This <laughs> is like, as an artist, you always want to yeah. like try to take it that next step, you know? And this is like perfect. It was like, with everything going on in the media, I was like, this is like God sent. I have to do this. So it felt right, you know? Yeah. 
So I, I want to know, is this show, is it solely about a comedic outlet for issues that people just can't wrap their heads around when it comes to how, what's going on nationally and locally? Or is there something deeper to this that you, that you really want to drive home when it comes to viewers? Well, well, Dark Justice is just basically, we're, we're making fun of people's perception of police officers. officers. So that's basically the whole theme of Dark Justice. It's not like an attack on police officers or anything like that. But it's just a, it's just a play on people's perception. So we're, we're really going to drive that home in season two. So, oh yeah, this is going to be season two. <laughs> so I'm excited. I'm excited. You guys should be excited. No, I understand Mike Garbino, a Rochester native, yes. uh, who is the writer and director for Dark Just Justice. He was moved to create the web series after the shooting death of Michael Brown in St. Louis in 2014. Yeah. How did the Dark Justice team see this show as really an outlet for creative expression when we're when we're looking at the tensions that exist in our society? You know, um, I, I just think it's, as an artist, and once again, I think it's really cool to just like be able to speak out on, on things like that using your talent. Cause you know, I, don't, I really don't have much. Like I'm not like the richest guy in the world. I'm not like the best cook. I can't like make meals, but I can like act. You know what I mean? So I can use that to be able to speak out. And that's what I can, you know, and I, I think the same thing for Mike Gerbino and Travis Cannon. And, um, there's a couple others I'm forgetting right now because I'm nerves. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing great. But uh, yeah, so that's basically it. And you know, I just think they're just using their talents to you know speak out on big big matters. And and it's definitely it's definitely a risk. Um, but you know, what, what's art? What's good art without risk? So the online world can be a brutal place yeah. and, and and all you need to do is scan the comment section right of an article or a YouTube video and you'll see there, there's no shortage of critics. Yeah. How are people responding to this show? Are they connecting with it? Are they getting the humor or are you hearing is it a mixed bag? It's actually it's great and it's that's such a blanket statement because it's like it's great in a sense it's like we're getting the we're getting the feedback that we want like oh it's funny and da 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 da, da. but at the same time we're getting the feedback where it's like oh I don't understand how you guys can like attack da, 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 now we're getting that kind of other the other feedback we wanted too, you know to bring up discussions and we don't want it to be heated or anything but it just goes to like it's, it's just fun it's just great it's just a big blanket statement <laughs> <laughs> have you learned anything about yourself or these issues that we're dealing with being involved in this series man honestly what I've learned from my character is just to like treat everyone with the same equality you know because the character Amir Johnson he's like like noble to a sense it's like he treats everyone with equality and he doesn't see why there's you know black and white in, in his position you know what I mean but yeah so he's just trying to basically learn about like equality and stuff and that's that's what I'm trying to like get better at so so how do how relatable do you think the characters are for for viewers do you think that it's possible that we could people could see themselves in the lieutenant or you know or, or, or your fellow police officers and maybe not even realize it yeah actually I I, th I see a, like a lot of everyone in um in a mirror like everyone that I've ever encountered you know I, he, I see a sensible side I see you know his angry side you know when there's injustice towards people of color and you know the racist comments Stanton makes like oh it, it must or, or the lieutenant makes he's like it must have been this black person who went in there and yeah. took took that and left and you know like all those things it, it's like a mixed bag for real but it's it, it's there's a humanity there I think it goes across the board you know well filming for the second season of Dark Justice begins this fall so we'll look forward to seeing what's next for Amir Johnson when season two drops and yes. a special thank you to my guest actor Shay Holloway be sure to check out the entire first season of Dark Justice at darkjusticeshow.com the Federal Aviation Administration released new rules going into effect this month, which will essentially open the door to more companies to get into the business of flying. Drones, that is. According to technology firm Gartner, America's drone business could be worth $7 billion in a decade. Here in Rochester, RIT researchers want in. And as Sasha Ann Simons tells us in this Innovation Trail report, the school plans to take the small aircrafts to new heights. On a cloudy summer morning in an open field in Rochester, New York, a group of men had their eyes fixed on the sky. RIT professor Carl Salvaggio was joined by imaging science students and a longtime pilot. The trio was flying an unmanned aircraft system, also known as a drone. In a flight like we're doing right now, we're probably going to collect about 400 images over this area, and then we'll stitch all those together and make one large what's called a mosaic. 
The researchers are testing the drone's compass, sensors, and six high-definition cameras to see how well the device can provide aerial imagery for precision farming. This is the second in a series of 20-minute test flights. Using a computer loaded with data tracking software, Salvaggio and his team assessed the health of the vegetation. We have to make sure every one of those images is, is, is presenting exactly the same information um, so that when we put it all together, it's one consistent vegetation map. As the grass looks more and more um, bright in the near infrared, that means it's healthier. America's skies may soon see more drones being used this way. New rules set by the Federal Aviation Administration are widely expected to make it easier for companies, farmers, and government agencies to use the devices for things like mapping and site inspections. That's according to Fortune magazine. The 600-plus pages of new regulations require drone operators to keep the unmanned aircraft within sight, avoid flying it over people, operate only during daylight, and pass a written exam every two years. Users say the guidelines add welcome structure to the practice. I don't think the FAA is in the business of trying to keep people out of, of this market. I think they just want to know who's in here. They want to know um, what platforms they're operating. About 30 miles southeast of the city, Brian Petrie's business office is lined with various types of drones. The home point has been updated. Please check it on the map. Petrie co-founded a drone education company called Skyop LLC three years ago. The company offers a college-level course at eight schools on how to operate the devices. He says drone popularity has skyrocketed since he got involved in the industry and says it's only a matter of time before the FAA pushes the new regulations to new heights. That whole committee that was formed is now working on the next set of rules that they're going to put out. It'll include things like the ability to fly beyond visual line of sight. Small drones will be allowed to fly over crowds that wouldn't cause personal harm. It's also about nighttime flying. Salvaggio is also looking forward to some more leeway. Being able to fly further will let us do things that we can't do right now. Because the industry has grown so much, RIT applied for a $1 million grant for drone research, and they've recently set up a lab. The goal, to see how drone technology could serve even more commercial needs. Water quality monitoring is just one of a list of ideas the team is pondering. We're working with some folks um, out on Owasco Lake where we're trying to map the algal blooms um, that are forming on that lake due to runoff from fertilizers. For the Innovation Trail, I'm Sasha Ann Simons. This story was part of the Innovation Trail, a reporting project that explores the link between technological breakthroughs and the revitalization of upstate New York. And that is it for this edition of Need to Know, Rochester's news magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for tuning in tonight and throughout the weekend here on WXXI TV. And if you ever miss an episode on television, catch us online at WXXINews.org under the Need to Know link. Have a great night.